Welcome to episode 43 of Fireside Chat. This is our first ever on-location episode. This is Matt and Dan here from Arena A at uh, Windsport. Matt, how you doing? Oh, very good. Awesome as always. And we've had the chance this weekend to be part of the Alzheimer's Pro-Am tournament. This is a tournament where the Alzheimer's uh, Association here in Alberta puts it on to raise money for Alzheimer's, and they let players buy into the tournament. And what you actually get is you're, you get to draft, if you will, an NHL alumni who's been involved with the tournament. So Matt and I have had the chance to call the All-Star game for this and the two championship games today. What did you think of the uh, championship games that went on earlier today where some teams played against NHL alumni? Oh, the the effort level and compete level was there for both sides. The first game with uh, Holmes by Abby. Uh, Alby, Alby Holmes. Alby Holmes, my mistake. Uh, they, they played very high-tempo, high-paced game. The second one was a little more sloppy. And the alumni that were here, we had Perry Berzan, Rene Corbet, Guy Carboneau, Russ Courtnell, Theo Fleury, Curtis Joseph, who played the weekend as a forward, which is kind of interesting to watch yesterday, uh, Tim Hunter, Claude Lemieux, Jamie McCowan, Wayne McBean, Brad May, Lanny McDonald, Marty McSorley, Mark Napier, Joel Otto, Dana Merzen, Colin Patterson, Stefan Riche, Gary Roberts, Poplinski, Jeremy Roenick, Gord Shrevin, Brian Trottier, and Jeff Shantz, and Rhett Warner. So a lot of big names, both from the Flames community and elsewhere, and it's it's been a lot of fun to be part of this this weekend. Oh, yeah, and it's nice to see these players coming out for such a good cause and the corporate sponsors raising a lot of funds for the community as well. So it's yeah. good. Yeah, and good to see the compete level from a lot of them. A lot of them still looking like they're in good shape. Yes. So we're here in Arena A of Windsport. This is the home of Hockey Canada, and we're getting a little bit of interference tonight. You might hear it on the show, a little bit of interference from the setup here. There's a lot of audio gear already in place at the arena, so just bear with us. Yeah, it's a little crackly, but there's not much we can do with it because of the interference. So, Matt, the last week has been uh, an interesting week for the Flames. They had a couple wins, a couple losses going on. Um, They beat in the last game, uh, they beat the Panthers which was a good game to see. Joey Mack was in net, a guy that I never thought we'd expect to see in a Flames jersey again, and he looked pretty solid. Um, he's a UFA at the end of the year. Do you think the Flames should re-sign him? Honestly, some teams should sign him because he's a serviceable backup, but realistically, it would be better for the Flames to have Yanni Ordeo get that full-time backup duty where he's playing 35-40 games instead almost a 1b in that case than a backup yeah because like he did come in and perform rather well and did not look out of place at all and you know between him and Kari Ramo you have a good one two going there so you know good on Joey Mack for showing at least that he's still got his game going and you know I hope he gets a job somewhere next season he definitely deserves it yeah, he's uh, he's a good backup uh, for a mid-range team. So well, and he's done well for us. I mean, if you look at the Flames' backups over the last little bit, they've had this revolving door backup. They went from McElhaney and um, oh, who is the guy they brought in and did the karate moves? Oh, Henry Carlson. Henry Carlson, and then you know there's never really any consistency there, and it seemed like we couldn't get a good backup to save our lives. And McDonald, they picked up off waivers, and he was exactly what Kipper needed. He was a steady backup who we could rely on on nights that Kipper couldn't play. So I think he served us well, but I agree with you. I think it's time for him to move on out of Calgary. Before that, we also had a great win over the uh, Tampa Bay Lightning arch rivals from the 4 run to the Cup, and we ended up beating them 4-1, to one, and that was actually uh, a little bit of a symbolic thing for Kerry Ramo, I think, who was drafted by that organization. and Yeah, kind of got cast aside. So Yeah. Yeah, I, they've been pretty much consistently playing uh, their game that we've seen over the last month or two. So, you know, uh, very good efforts. You can't really complain with how they're playing at all. The other thing I think that's different that we've seen uh, recently is that the the tough guys, McGratton and Westgarth, have been chipping in more offensively over this past week than we've seen before. Yeah, and... I think that comes partially due to the fact that the Flames are no longer in it, so they're a little bit more free to 
try and score some goals, and even if they might not be in the proper defensive positioning that they would normally, you know, because they're out there basically just to be, you know, not have anything wrong happen on the ice. So, yeah, and you know, I mean, we know that Gratz has got some offensive upside. I mean, we've seen him score some goals in the past. I wonder if the coaching staffs also kind of told these guys, look, you know, you're on the roster. We want to get these kids out there and get them some points. So if you can chip in offensively and help them out, that'd be great. Yeah. And like Wes Garth, I believe he's a UFA or an RFA at the end of the year. And, you know, he's got to look forward to getting another contract from someone. If it's not us, someone else. So, you know, he's got to weigh that as well. And if he can chip in some offense, then he can say, oh, well, look at my stats. I'm not completely terrible out there. So, Yeah, and, you know, as a, I think as a bruiser, there's a couple of those guys around the league. And the more you can uh, set yourself apart from the rest of them by saying, yeah, I've got, you know, some offensive ability, the better you're going to be. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, good for them. The Flames have had the weekend off, but uh, Friday night when they did play the Panthers, as we talked about earlier, we saw the first professional goal from Kenny Agostino. He's uh, taken a little bit of time to get adjusted to the NHL game, not just because he hasn't scored a goal yet, but we saw him play about a week ago, and he didn't seem like he was fully adjusted to the NHL game yet. Do you think there's a guy who will have a, a long NHL career? I could definitely, with his compete level and the tools that he has in his toolbox, he should be an NHL player for quite a while. Perhaps he doesn't have quite the offensive ability that you would like, but, you know, he he's a player that he should be at least a serviceable third, fourth line guy. He might only get, like, at best, like, 30 points in a season, but... You know, it, if you can, anytime you can add a player like that that's defensively responsible to your lineup, that's a good thing. Yeah, he might not replace the guy we got rid of for him, which was Jerome McGinley, but um, yeah, I definitely think that he'll probably be around the NHL, the AHL. I don't see him getting an NHL spot out of camp next year. I think he'll be a guy that's going to need a couple years in the AHL to get some seasoning, but I think that he'll probably put up uh, good numbers for the Heat next year. Yeah. And additionally, you need talented players to play on the farm as well. So that way, like if you do get guys like, say, Poirier and Klimchuk going to the AHL next year, they'll have somebody that's qualified to play with them instead of some random AHL veteran that might not have the talent necessary to complete plays and foster the our guys' development. We're seeing, too, this year that, I mean, the Heat are running for the Calder Cup already. And I think when you have a successful AHL team, as we do this year, it makes that transition to the NHL easier when guys get called up or got brought up full-time. I mean, we've seen a lot of guys get called up, and they've been able to step into that lineup right away and know what's expected of them. So I think, yeah, if you have a competitive AHL team, it's going to be a lot easier for you to be able to bring guys up and down quite easily and have them mesh into the NHL game. Yeah, and it's not like the Abbotsford Heat are full of veteran players that are carrying the torch. It, I think Abbotsford has one of, if not the youngest, AHL team. So, you know, uh, we have good prospects down there that are being facilitated by some veterans, but, you know, th our young guys are decent enough and, like, they're carrying the torch themselves. For sure. And another guy that I think we'll probably see playing for the Abbotsford Heat next year is the Flames' newest signing. He's a college player that was just picked up by the Flames as an unrestricted free agent, 22-year-old Bryce Van Brabant. And he joined the team last week. He's six foot two, 205 pounds. Uh, he's a left winger, wearing number 48 right now. And we've seen him in a couple games so far. And again, a guy who's coming out of college and to me looks like he's not fully adjusted to the NHL game yet. Yeah, and... Realistically, Van Brabant is not someone that, like, if you're expecting him to come in and be a scorer for you, you're probably going to be leaving a lot left to be desired there. But, you know, he's more of a Kevin Westgarth type of guy where he's more of a physical presence, and, like, that will likely be his game at the NHL level if he makes it full-time. 
He has truculence. He's a Brian Burke-like player on paper. Yes. And he definitely rates highly on the truculence factor there. You know, it's weird. We almost need, as, as Flames fans, a way to rate a guy's truculence. Like, we need to say, you know, this guy is 6 out of 10 on the truculence scale somehow. Yeah, and someone like Johnny Gaudreau is, like, probably a negative 6. <laughs> Maybe over the summer you and I can develop the uh, Fireside Chat truculence meter. Yeah. A scale well, to rate a guy's truculence. Yeah, well, I think Van Brabent right now is probably about a 7 on the uh, truculence scale. He's 22, making his NHL debut. I was actually surprised that he debuted with the Flames this year. It seems like they're just trying to get as many young guys in the roster as they can. But I'm, I would have thought they would have signed him. I mean, he hasn't been in the organization for a while. It almost seems like he's taken a spot from someone who might deserve it a bit more. I thought they'd sign him, bring him in, have him watch the footage, practice, but never actually hit the ice. Well, the thing is, is that the Flames were not the only one that was trying to sign him. So, you know... If another team's offering only, like, an AHL job and we're offering five games at the end of the season, then he might have gone with us just for that reason. Yeah, I don't even know. I don't think you could give him an AHL job now because you're signed after the deadline. But Yeah. So, overall, it's been a fairly good week for Flames fans. Even the games that we lost against Ottawa, I thought we put in a decent effort. And if we look at the clock now, we've really only got a season of uh, NHL hockey left. It's the sixth right now, and the final game is next Sunday. And we've really got four games left on the schedule, two at home and two on the road. Yeah. Uh, the games against New Jersey and uh, Vancouver on the road are, should be interesting. Yeah, we have New Jersey on Monday. Uh, we have the Kings on Wednesday. We have the Jets on Friday, and then we wrap up with the Canucks and you know, I really think, um, I really think that, I if you look at these games, none of them are going to be all that hard for the Flames. I think that we'll see that the uh, the Devils, the Kings, their their teams are doing well, but I don't think that they're going to be coming out hard in those games. We may even start to see some backup players playing. Yeah, and that's good as well. You know, like the Flames need to get know how to play teams that might be dogging it a bit as well, so that way. Like, in a regular game situation, like, if a team does come out flat, like, you know how to steamroll them. So, you know, it's a good thing. Yeah. Different scenarios, it's always good to learn how to adjust to things. Different scenarios, um, I think we will see the Flames coming out hard and perhaps getting a jump on those teams because of that. This team's been playing really hard lately. Um but yeah, we're mathematically out of the playoffs at this point. We have a week of Flames hockey left, which enjoy it now because it's going to be a long time till we see Flames hockey again. It's going to be a long spring with no Flames hockey. But if, hey, if you're a golfer, maybe you'll get to see the Flames out on the course. And just after the season ends, we've got the uh, the draft lottery coming up. Yeah, on uh, Tuesday, April 15th, we'll find out which of the losers gets the best pick. So I, I really... I'm not too concerned about where the Flames pick in this. Uh, my ideal would be that we finish above Edmonton and pick before Edmonton. Yeah. Well, if we
some of the potential players that we might get in the first round with that pick. Yeah. That was one of our most popular episodes last year was profiling some of the players the Flames get, so we'll definitely be doing that again. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to doing some more in-depth analysis of guys that we should be able to get in the first round. Guys like Sam Bennett or Leon Dreistel or Michael Balcali, Nikolai Ellers. You know, there's yeah. a bunch of guys. So, And yeah. then in the weeks leading up to the draft, we'll talk about some of the other rounds that we have as well because we have a pretty full slate of picks this year. I think we're picking in every round. Uh, no, we are not. We don't have a fourth or a fifth oh, right. because of uh, Russell and Colborn. Right. But uh, we do have five picks in the top 90. Five picks so in the top 90 will be nice. Yeah, so we should be able to uh, and that's get some discussion about... That's as we sit now on the 6th of April. I mean, things may change with what, what we've got by the time yeah, we'll get to the draft table. Yeah, because you never table. know. Uh, like, you might see a guy like Hoodler or Glencross or Weidman get dealt at the draft. Yeah. So, you know, five for now, it might be six or seven or eight later. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, yeah, next week we will come back after the season and discuss the end of the season. But I think from uh, Winsport here at Arena A, we're going to call this one for this week. Yeah, and uh, just wanted to say thanks to all our listeners for keeping up and listening to us. And thanks to the uh, Pro-Am Hockey uh, Tournament here for bringing us in this weekend. We've had a lot of fun. Yeah, it's been a blast. We'll talk to you all next week. Take care.